Amen. I'm so happy to see you all. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Welcome to worship and welcome to the teaching of the Word of God. I would like to greet you, those that are part of the church family here, and those that are guests of the house with a potential of becoming part of the family as well. Happy Sabbath, everybody. I would like to start with a story of a historical reality that sounds somewhat like an anecdote. And I'm using the story for the sake of uh, the moral teaching that it conveys, not necessarily for the value of uh, the historical reality. So I'm not going to say who and where was it done. So the story says that the ambassador of a certain country in that other country where he was representing his own country was giving a press conference and in the beautiful and smooth language of diplomacy, he was speaking about peace, how important peace was. And as the journalists were listening, one was daring enough to raise his hands and uh, ask a question. He said, Mr. Ambassador, we hear what you are saying, we understand peace is important, but I have a question. Why is that aircraft carrier out there in the bay? To which the ambassador said, what aircraft carrier? And he said, that one. If you look through the window, you could see the gigantic structure of the aircraft carrier. So the ambassador looked through the window, and then he said, I can't see any aircraft carrier. To which the journalist said, uh, Mr. Ambassador, are you making fun of us? And he said, no, not at all. The thing is, you know, I'm not authorized to see any aircraft carrier. <laughs> My question this morning to me and to you is, are you authorized to see the truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your truth as it's revealed in the Bible. And we thank you for your grace that helps us assimilate your truth. We pray that you will open our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, the eyes of our minds, that we will see it, will grasp it, will live it in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen. The book of Ephesians, chapter 4. We are continuing our journey, and I'm going to start reading with verse 11. Ephesians, chapter 4. Verse 11, and he himself, that is Jesus Christ, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And we've seen that the fullness of Christ is he was full of grace and truth. If I can symbolically represent his measure of fullness, this is Christ's 
measure of fullness. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love, that is verse 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So we are to grow up into him who is the head. These here want to grow up and become like this here. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, and I put in parenthesis there the wording in the Greek, because the wording in the Greek uses the same word measure that was used for Christ previously. The effective working of each part, meaning each part, in measure, that is, Christ is the one that pours himself into each one of these parts. And each part, from the smallest to the biggest, does their own part, their own part in measure, according to their own measures. We are growing. Some are already more mature, some are younger, some are children, some are teenagers. I put a special cup for teenagers because teenagers are special in many ways. <laughs> we are growing. We are all growing of each part in measure, says the Apostle Paul, causes growth of the body, the body of Christ, for the edifying of itself in love. This I say, he says, verse 17, therefore, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer, and when he says no longer, it means that something should stop. You should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened, verse 18, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the, you say it please, blindness. They cannot see. But what Paul is saying is, yes, the rest of the Gentiles cannot see because of their ignorance. They cannot see because of the blindness of their heart. But now he's writing to some people in the church. Those in Ephesus that he's writing to are part of the church. Having somehow the same kind of problem of blindness. Blindness of their heart, and the word there is obviously cardia. Previously, we've seen the word knows in verse 17, please bring it back, verse 17, the futility of their mind, that's knows. And then verse 18 speaks about understanding. The Greek speaks about thoughts, dianoia. Dianoia in Greek is that what crosses the mind. What crosses the mind? Thoughts are those that cross the mind. So there's a problem with the mind. There's a problem with the thoughts. There's a problem with the cardia, with the heart. And Paul says, 
who being past feeling, verse 19, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. That is the problem of the rest of the Gentiles. But Paul says, you, those among the Gentiles that came to Christ Jesus, you should no longer walk like them, meaning that some of them were still walking like the rest of the Gentiles. And Paul says, it has to stop. And uh, then he explains, verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. Okay, if not so, then how? If indeed you have heard him and have taught by him, have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. As the truth is in Jesus. One of my discoveries as I'm reading through and bringing the message week after week from the book of Ephesus is this concept of as the truth is in Jesus. I first encountered this phrase in LNG writings. Some of you may know that Ellen White, Ellen White uses quite often this expression, the truth as it is in Jesus. Have you heard that concept? The truth as it is in Jesus. And never, never up to this point did I realize that she was actually taking that concept from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21. She's not only focused on the truth, and please notice this, it's one thing to speak about the truth, and it's something else to speak about the truth as it is in Jesus. Well, you may think, what's the difference? Well, truth on itself and in itself can even kill. Truth as it is in Jesus Christ is truth combined with grace. We've learned up to this point. And that is absolutely necessary for growth. Without this combination that exists in Jesus Christ, there is no way for these little measures to grow up to this measure. It's important, it's necessary, it is indispensable for truth to be mixed with grace. About Jesus, we can say that He was truthfully gracious, and he was also graciously truthful, because in him there was this beautiful mix, which means love. But I would like to go a little deeper and point out some practicalities of how Jesus handled the truth. And I'm going to present seven points all seven taken from the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John speaks a lot about the truth and about the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. The first point that I want to emphasize is that Jesus Christ knew what or who the truth was. Is that important? He knew what or who the truth was. What was the truth? John 17, 17. Sanctify or set them apart by your truth, His truth, God's truth. Your word is truth. Jesus knew God's word was truth. He also unapologetically said, I am the truth. Because there is a one-on-one -on -one overlap between the Word of God, the written Word, and the Word of God, the incarnate Word, Jesus Christ. Second point, 
Jesus Christ knew his own mission was to witness to the truth. In John chapter 18, Jesus was speaking with somebody. You remember who that was? And to that somebody, he said, For this cause I have come into the world. What cause? That I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. To whom was he speaking? Pilate. And you re remember his uh, reaction? Pilate said, what is truth? Very philosophical question. What is truth? Well, Jesus says, hey, I'm here to testify about the truth. He actually was. The truth was there in front of Pilate, and Pilate was asking, what's the truth? Point number three, Jesus saw the truth as liberating. I'm sure you know this verse, John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And now he says, and you shall know what? The truth. And the truth shall make you free. Free of what? Free of what? In context there, you would see that Jesus is speaking about the slavery of sin. Getting to know the truth has a liberating effect on us. Gets us out of the slavery of sin. Next point, point number four. Jesus knew and uh, he dared to upset people with the truth. Now, you would not expect this one. Because unfortunately, we have come to an age in Christianity when Jesus is presented in a certain way, you know, where Jesus only speaks things that everybody wants to hear, and he would never say anything to affect anybody negatively or bring out a negative reaction. And that's not Jesus. He dared to upset people with the truth. Look, in, look for instance, in John chapter 6, verse 60, I put the NAS version there because it conveys the message better in this verse. So then many of his disciples, he had disciples. Disciple means somebody that sits down and listens to you, watches you for quite some time. Many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this statement is very unpleasant. Who can listen to it? Who can get it? Who can, who, who can accept something like this? Yes, Jesus dared upset at some points people with the truth. Point number five. He respected people's choice of the truth. Those people that were upset by the truth by his truth, says in uh, John chapter 6, they even left him, they abandoned him. So at one point, Jesus turns to the disciples, the 12, that did not leave. And this is what he asks. Do you also want to go away? It's like, hey, guys, nobody forces you. Nobody pushes you. It is your decision and I respect your decision. He respected the decision of those that left. He never complained about them. He never blamed them. Out, uh, them. They never bashed them. No, he respected them. Point number six. He would call out hypocritical truth. Now, this is something very unpleasant he would call out hypocritical truth. What is hypocritical truth? Hypocritical truth is when somebody says this is truth and then he or she acts or reacts as if that truth was not the truth or did not even exist. And that's hypocrisy. And look, for instance, in chapter 9, 
John chapter 9, verse 41, Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Yeah, if you were blind, no problem. But you say you see, therefore your sin remains. And I have a seventh point. He sometimes concealed the truth. Please notice the word that I underlined there is conceal, not cancel. He sometimes concealed the truth. How? Well, for instance, he would speak in parables. Do you know why he would speak in parables? Because speaking with parables can give you the opportunity to reveal and conceal truth at the same time. Those who have to understand will understand, and those who do not have to understand will not understand. But not only that. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 16. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So watch out, please. Especially those that have a reputation about truth-telling, and I'm speaking to myself as well. Nobody, not even Christ, teaches you that you have to tell the truth at all costs at all time. Mm -mm. There are times when the best thing is to zip it. Because the people you want to convey that truth to are not able to get it, to take it. Jesus himself says, I still have many things to say to you. Say them, Jesus. Come on. Uh -uh. Why not? You can't take them. You can't bear them now. Well, with all this in mind, I would like to just ask you, are you allowed, are you authorized to see the truth as it is in Jesus? Are you authorized or somebody forbids it? Or somebody says, no, no, don't do it. I have to confess, it's not easy in this day and age to see the truth as it is in Jesus. Because many times we hear that we are not authorized to see the truth as it is in Jesus. And I would like to show you why it is so difficult. And I'm going to do this short illustration speaking about myself. Please know that when I'm speaking about myself, I may be speaking about you as well. And then the question is, are you authorized to see the truth? I'm going to just open the Bible. And I am planning to see the truth as it is in Jesus Christ in this area. For instance, Matthew chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 7. That's exactly where my Bible got open. I didn't plan on this. But this is part of the famous teaching of Jesus Christ on the mountain, right? Do you know this section of the Bible? Of course. But now my question is, are you authorized to see the truth in there? Because when I'm opening the Bible there, there is on my Bible a sheet of the history of Christianity, included my denomination. And because I know how Christianity has operated throughout Christianity, throughout the history of Christianity, this sheet is on my Bible. And now I'm reading through this filter, right? Well, no, 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 I cannot read through this filter because there's one more layer, one more sheet. The doctrines and the dogmas of Christianity included my church. And now I also have this sheet 
on my truth. And now I'm reading through this filter too. But wait, wait, wait. I still cannot read because there's another sheet, the sheet of church traditions, traditions of Christianity and traditions of my own denomination. And that sheet is also there and is a filter of my truth. And now I'm reading through this filter as well. But wait, I also have a filter of Ellen G. White quotes out of context because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, so now I'm, I'm reading through this filter as well. But wait, I still cannot read because I have another sheet with the ideas of my favorite preachers and theologians. And all those ideas are on my Bible and now I can read but I have that filter too. No, no, wait, I still have another filter, and this is the teachings of my parents about God. And uh, yeah, I can't avoid this filter as well, uh, and I have to put it there, so now I'm reading through this filter as well, and yet I cannot read because there's another filter coming, postmodern philosophy taught in school. Hmm, what am I going to do? I have this sheet there as well, so now I have one more filter, and I want to read, but wait, I can't read yet, because there's another sheet of political correctness by media and social media, and I have to be aware of that too, so I would now start reading with all that in mind. But wait, I can't yet, because I have my own cherished ideas, dreams, and interests, and those are there as well. So now this is my complete set of filters, and I want to read. Can I read? Not yet, because I also have some hidden sinful pleasures, some lusts that I want to be justified by the truth, so I place that too there, and now I can read. Now tell me, please, what can I read now? What? What can I read now? You understand? Yes, the Bible. I would like to read the Bible, but for me to be able to read the Bible, something has to happen. What? Somebody has to remove the filter. Somebody has to take the filters and throw them aside. And now I could read. You think this is easy? I'm speaking about myself. I may be speaking about you as well. You may be having different filters, but we all have filters. So whenever I go to the Bible, who so many filters here, I should uh, sell them and buy some valuable stuff. That's the problem. Whenever I start reading the Bible, I pray, Lord, Please empty my mind of, of filters, of agendas that I bring to the Bible so that I will make the Bible sound the way I want it to sound. Remove the filters, remove the agendas, because many of those agendas, some are good agendas, some are good. And I will take some of these agendas back because some of them are good. If you had a good Christian parent or parents, that's a good filter, but you don't need it when you read the Word. It can help you in life. A good preacher, a, a good theologian that you learn from, yes, those can be good. Even church tradition can be good if it doesn't become a law for somebody else. The point is, when I come to the Bible, I want God to be able to move me on to His agenda instead of me setting for Him my or somebody else's agenda. Are you still allowed? Are you still authorized to see the truth? 
I would like to read from Ellen G. White, from Christ's object lesson. First, what truth in Christ and truth through Christ represented to her. She said, truth in Christ and truth through Christ is measureless. The student of scripture looks as it were, into a fountain that deepens and broadens as he gazes into its depth. It goes deeper and wider. Then she continues, the truth as it is in Jesus can be experienced, but never explained. Its height and breadth and depth pass our knowledge. Then, she says, we may task our imagination to the utmost, and then we shall see, okay, are you allowed, are you authorized to see? And then we shall see only dimly the outlines of a love that is unexplainable, that is as high as heaven, but that stooped to the earth, to stamp the image of God on all mankind. Isn't that beautiful? Truth as it is in Jesus. And then, from the same book, Christ's Objects Lesson, if you search the scriptures, watch this, to vindicate your own opinions, that's exactly what I was talking about. Move one slide back. See, that's the list of my filters. One slide back. See, that's the list of my filters. Those that are scattered down here and some I saved because those are good. Can be good, I want to say. But if you just try to vindicate your own ideas, go back to the quote, please. Your opinions you will never reach the truth. You will read the Bible and you will understand from the Bible exactly what you want to understand. And you will jubilate and say, yeah, I got the truth. Mm -mm. You got the confirmation of your own mind. Search in order to learn what the Lord says, the truth as it is in Jesus. Go on. If conviction comes as you search, if you see, are you authorized to see? If you see that your cherished opinions are not in harmony with the truth, do not misinterpret the truth in order to suit your own belief, but what? Accept the light given. Hmm. And then... Open mind and heart. Remember, that's what Paul was talking about. There's a problem with the mind, and there's a problem with the cardia, the heart. Open mind and heart that you may behold wondrous things out of God's Word. And I would say, <laughs> hallelujah. That's what I want. That's my desire every day single time I go to the Bible. And if you do that, and will start talking about the truth you discovered, you will become a weirdo, a strange guy, or a strange lady, even among your own. Yes, it's a reality. Because there is resistance to the truth. But says the Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20, 20, 20, but you have not so learned Christ. But how? Well, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, and now move on, please, that you put off Concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt 
according to the deceitful lusts or desires or longings and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, metanoia. Yes, what Paul says, some in the church needs, need a new conversion experience, a new metanoia. And that you put on the new man. The new man, not this one, because that's what we tend to do. We put it off and then take it on again. No, no. You, knew, you need a new man to put on, which was created according to God, that is in Jesus Christ, as we saw it in chapter 2, in true righteousness and holiness. And I have three words there, true righteousness and holiness. My question for you is, which word should be emphasized there? Out of the three words. Which one? Ah, oh, you got it. The emphasis should be on what? True. Because there is fake righteousness and there is fake holiness. So the emphasis there is on true, because true comes from the truth. Not anyways, but as the truth is in Jesus. The truth as it is in Jesus generates true what? True righteousness and holiness. You know, my, my mother had three cousins, three sisters, daughters of the same father. And all three of them married Eastern Orthodox priests. All three of them. So three sisters, all three married Orthodox priests. I was in pretty good relationship with one of these uncles now of mine. And uh, this guy used to be some sort of a, an archbishop. That would be the equivalent in uh, uh, the Western language, because this is Eastern Orthodox, right? Archbishop. So one of his achievements, so to speak, was that he built in the capital city of my county. My county is Salaj County. My name is Salajan, so my name comes from the county Salaj, so I have my own county, if you can believe that. Well, that was a joke. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I represent, my name represents the county I was born in. So this guy, my uncle, he built a huge cathedral in that capital city of my county. And you may know that Eastern Orthodox churches have pictures, pictures of the saints or pictures of the righteous and holy, if you understand what I'm speaking about. But here, here's the, the catch. My uncle said he was fed up with the way the Eastern Orthodox saints looked on the wall. Do you know how Eastern Orthodox saints look on the wall? Like that. Long horse face, all sad. They have the, the, the head in a certain position like this. No? And, and he said, no, 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 I don't like that. So he commissioned the work to an American painter, a very expensive artist and his team. So this American artist and his team came over there and they painted the pictures on the inside and everything was fine. He, he painted, they painted bright, almost uh, not just lively, almost smiley faces, you know, like happy saints on the wall. Nobody saw anything like that in, in, uh, in that corner of the world. And everything was fine until his first inspection came, you know, when uh, somebody higher ranking in the hierarchy came to see how the works were going. And they said, oh my Lord, you destroyed righteousness and holiness. So one day I'm going to him to visit. I had some uh, chit-chat with him. And he takes me to the big cathedral. 
He always wanted to come, not, not even him, his wife, my auntie, always wanted to convince me to become an Easter Orthodox church. He said, hey, you have good voice, you would feel that cathedral. <sighs> so he takes me into the cathedral. Yeah, I had a problem with the truth, that's why I couldn't. Uh, and in the cathedral, he shows me the pictures on the wall, and he asks me, don't you think these saints look more genuine than the long horse-faced saints? And I said, mm, I think so. But then on my way from his house, I was thinking and I said, hmm. His question was interesting. My question was matching, my answer was matching his question. But did I give him the right answer? What makes a saint a saint? What makes somebody righteous and holy? Let me put it in this context. What, what makes somebody truly righteous and holy? Can't a smile be a fake smile? Because here, here in this culture, we've moved to the other end. We know that protocol smile. Is that what makes it genuine? No. True righteousness and holiness comes from truth. What kind of truth? As it is in Jesus. I just finished teaching a summer class to some teachers from uh, many places and uh, I, I taught denominational history, the history of our Seventh-day Adventist denomination. And because I was studying side by side my uh, sermon passages, something became very obvious to me, is that in the history of Seventh-day Adventism, we always cherished the truth. What we struggled with was to cherish the truth as it is in Jesus. Let me give you an example. You probably know that Ellen White and James White, husband and wife, were very big voices and personalities in the beginnings of our denominational history. Now, <clears throat> it's obvious that James White was a truth-loving guy. Our first fundamental belief, Seventh-day Adventist fundamental belief or statement, comes from James White before the Seventh-day Adventist church even was organized. Because we got organized in 63, and this is in the 50s. In the 50s, somebody through the Review and Herald asked a question with regard to the belief of Seventh-day Adventists. Because at that time in America, we already had Seventh-day Baptists. So if somebody thinks we discovered the Sabbath, mm -mm. Seventh-day Baptists were keeping the Sabbath. With a different nuance to it, but they were keeping the Sabbath, and we actually got it from them. So somebody, a Seventh-day Baptist, asked the question with regard to the belief of Seventh-day Adventists. And this is how James White answers to that inquiry. In uh, Review and Herald, 1853, so this is 10 years before our denomination is even organized. And while sending here, he says, with the aid of no other creed, than the Word of God, no other creed than the Word of God, and bound together by the bonds of love. What kind of love? Love for the truth, love for each other, and love for a per perishing world. Which is stronger than death, he says, that kind of love. All party feelings are 
lost. Hmm, that's interesting. If you look at that order, love for the truth first, love for each other, and then love for a perishing world, is that the right order? You may say, well, I guess. But is that love for the truth as it is in Christ? Because if you know the history of James White, you know that he struggled with love as it is in Christ. And his wife, Ellen White, was constantly and patiently working on him. He got in trouble to the point where in 1876, for a short time, a few months, they even got separated, if you can believe that. And the main point of this court was this. They had a rebellious son. His name was Edson. And the father was treating with him with the truth. And the mother was telling him, James, put some grace in it. Put some grace in it. Otherwise, you will push him even further. Then they reconciled. And that separation was happening while he was, guess what, GC president. See what, what truth and truth as it is in Christ, in, in Jesus Christ, can make. But change was obvious with James White because look what happens, and I have uh, some pictures there. In 1873, that was the picture called The Way of Life, endorsed by James White, and uh, that picture was practically giving the gospel they were using, evangelists were using that picture to show newcomers or those that came to evangelistic sermons what the way of life was like. What is the most prominent thing there? Well, you have the tablets of the law. See? The cross is there too, but there's a, a big what? An eye. You know what that eye represents? God watching you. He's watching you. He's watching you. And they got to the realization, no, no, that's not the correct picture of God. God is not like that. Some of you have been having. I myself used to have that picture of God. They changed the picture. James White changed the picture can you see the difference now here? What is the big difference? The eye is gone. But otherwise, pretty similar. But then toward the end of his life, because he died in 81 at the age of 60 from working himself to death, practically. Because he was so legalist. He wanted to accomplish so much and so well. And Ellen White was working with him, trying to improve his health. In 80, 1880, he commissions an artist to redo the painting The Way of Life. And this was done in 83. He never saw the painting. He just gave the idea. Ellen White saw it and endorsed it. But look... The problem for James is that in 1881, he passed away. But at his funeral, one of the guys that attended, his name is D.M. Conright. This is what he said in his remembrance of, Ellen, of, of Elder White. So this is James White. As all will remember, he says, wherever he preached the past few months, he dwelt, he dwelt largely upon faith in Christ and the boundless love of God. Tell me what is weird in that expression there. What is weird is the past few months. In the past few months, say from 
from this point on, in the past few months, James White dwelt largely upon faith in Christ and the boundless love of God. What did he dwell on before that? See the problem? And then 1888 came, Minneapolis. And this is what Ellen White says about that, the hardest and most incomprehensible tug of war we have ever had among our people. You know what a tug of war is? When people fight for the truth, they have a tug of war. When you see the truth as if it's Jesus, there's nothing to fight for. The tug of war is within you. You fight with your own sinfulness. And that changes the whole picture. And then at the closing section of that GC session in 1888, this is what Ellen White said. We want the truth as it is in Jesus. And I have seen that precious souls who would have embraced the truth have been turned away from it. Why? Because of the manner in which the truth has been handled. And she continues saying, because Jesus, isn't that sad? Jesus was not in it. And this is what I have been pleading with you for all the time. We want Jesus. Brothers and sisters, that's what I want. I want Jesus, and I recommend to you the truth as it is in love. My question in Jesus, because Jesus is love, my question is, are you authorized to see the truth? <laughs>